mind. I mean, it, it blows my mind looking at this screen. We have absolute icons from three of like the most testosterone chalk fields in the world. <laughs> Bodybuilding, from boxing, from mixed martial arts. And there's those smiles because here's what I was going to say. Tough as they may appear and tough as they are, don't judge a book by its cover. Boss, take it away, my friend. All right, all right. Let me introduce you to a handsome fellow there, Sean Ray, beautiful bolt man. Look at this guy. I was talking about him last. Oh, look at his biceps. Those are marshmallows. Those are marshmallows. I was talking about him last week. He had a professional lady bodybuilder friend of mine, Lainey Thompson Holland. He was talking about him in 1989. She said we have to look out for him. And then in 1990, he became number three uh, at Mr. Olympia. So that they knew well before that he was going to do very well. You remember the movie Over the Top, you know, with Stallone and his baseball cap? Well, apparently with Sean, once he puts his bandana on, it's time for Sean to do the same thing. Always pushing the limits, says what's on his mind, because it is his opinion. And I love that about guys, because then you know where you stand. Godspeed, Thank guys. you, boss. I appreciate that, boss, but we're going to go a little bit bigger, like 370-some-odd pounds. The king of the four-rounders, Butterbean, Big E, Eric. Uh, this guy did it all. Not only was he a mixed martial artist, he's also in the tough man. In 1994, I believe, that's when you did your pro debut, uh, Butterbean, and, and that's when I was getting second in the Mr. Olympia. We kind of came up and arrived at the same time. So uh, you were out there doing your thing in the, uh, the boxing world. You did the tough man. You actually won two heavyweight, super heavyweight championships, I should say, the WWA, the WAA and the IBA, uh, super heavyweight titles. And uh, you, I think you, your last fight, I believe, was in 2002. Am I right with that one? Real close, yeah, about that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you were you were making some big headway in the late mid, or mid to late 90s into the 2000s, and uh, we're going to find out a little bit more about what you're doing today, but it's an honor to be here with you. And, of course, boss, uh, I got some love for people over in Dort, uh, Holland. What do you call it? Dutch, Dutch? That's what you speak? Dutch? Yes, N N Netherlands. It's really weird. You speak Dutch, but in Holland, say we speak Netherlandish. Netherlandish, like yes. <laughs> I got a good friend, Barry DeMay and uh, Erica Mess. And uh, Roly Winkler is, uh, comes from over there. So yeah. a lot of bodybuilders coming out of that area. And nice. I had a good time over there. Very well, good. Thank you for the mind all y'all. I tell you, I met him probably, it's been a good 20, 25 years ago. Rick, Rick is one of the toughest little guys I've I've known. I mean, he's struggled from cancer to a little bit of everything. I mean, it's like if life's trying to kill somebody, they've been it's been trying to kill Rick from it from the day he was born. <laughs> but he always pulls through and I always cheer for him, and I'm glad he does. And I'm glad he's he's still here with us now. But yeah, I mean, it's like one struggle after another. If anybody's ever had a bad luck with life being picking on him, it's Rick because man, he's had a, almost everything that could go wrong with a body. But man, look at him now, he's, he's kicking strong and he's still tough. And I, I'm glad to call him my friend. Oh, Bean, thank you, man. Yeah, I'm kind of like, I got something in my eye, I don't know what it is. Uh, man, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and mints. I in turn, so true, Rick. I mean, those mints, they're very strong. <laughs> it's giving you the hard bumps and, and cruises. You always come out with a smile on your face and in and, and good, positive vibes. And that's, that's what's great about you. Thank you, man. And getting better by the day, too. Thanks for saying that. And, you know, it, it, I love this, man. I get to introduce a good friend of mine in turn also. So, you know, I've, I've been around the pro wrestling, the mixed martial arts world for decades. And I often and I ask the question. I'm sorry. We're getting a lot of questions. I want to mention before I go on, everybody out there. Thank you. We screwed up last week. I screwed up. It's my fault. We did not take your questions. Throughout tonight's show, we're going to come back to you guys who are throwing these amazing questions up and address you. So sorry, and it's coming. I promise. <laughs> People have asked me for decades, who is the toughest person in mixed martial arts or in the world? And I'm not saying that because he's on the show with him because he's my friend. It's Boss Rutten. I've always, always believed that. Um, not just in a fight but how he handles life. This guy, too, has been to hell and back. There's a line in a song. I think it's a share song of all things. I'm showing my age. But yeah. it talks about walking through hell with a smile. And this guy, Boss Rutten, embodies that line better than anybody that I know. And that I've seen him in the past few years not only come out of it, but just become 24-7 this happy-go-lucky yet always thoughtful guy that I know my friend, 
And in my opinion, the world's toughest man to be, Boss Ritten. Oh, Rick, thank you for and very handsome and very beautiful. Yes, I know. I'm the package, the complete package, <laughs> as the ladies would call it. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Man, we go back a long time. I, re I, I, I think I met you already all the way back in 2000 or in 1998, I think, already over in Orange County. So, County. so that was like within a year when I arrived here in America. So, yeah, it's been a long time, my friend. But, hey, listen, enough about this handsome man right here. What is going on with everybody here? Who, what, what have been, uh, been up to? Well, let's say, uh, Butterbean, you start. Well, I just got back from a big appearance in Florida where I got to meet some great uh, voice actors, Tony the Tiger and uh, uh, Co Courage the Cowardly Dog. Oh, I, I know that. Crazy, but I had a great time this weekend. Nice. <laughs> I, just flew, I just flew in yesterday from Green Bay. I went to the Monday night football game. Uh, with the Packers and the Detroit Lions. Uh, my mentor who got me started in bodybuilding when I was 17 years old, John Brown, two-time Mr. Universe, three-time Mr. World, both of his sons were playing at wide receiver. One, as a rookie on the Detroit Lions, number 14, Amon Ross St. Brown from the University of Southern California. And his oldest son, Equinemius, who was my ring bearer uh, 20 years ago at my wedding, uh, play, playing in his fourth year as a wide receiver for the Packers. That's Equinemius. But I got to Green Bay by way of Hawaii. I ran out there, planted some seeds for my show coming up in November, came back to California for a night, flew out for the Monday night football game, went to sleep, and I woke up, and here we are. <laughs> so it was, it was a busy weekend for me. Wow. You, Rick? Oh, man. I am recovering from a big emotional letdown. Sean Ray was in Hawaii. He didn't come see me. Oh, and wow. I'm still trying to get over this. Uh, but that's all right. That's all right. I, I know we missed islands. We'll get it. We'll get it next time, my friend. Um, yeah. You know, I know you guys were jet setting all over the world. All you guys traveled this past weekend. And I remember my life being like that. What I did, you know, here's what I do now. I sit here with my dogs and Friday night comes around Saturday night. I sit on my sofa and I, I light all my candles. I get a hot sake or a glass of wine. And I watch movies, and I could not be happier, man. I know it sounds boring. That's, That's what romantic. I like these days. During the day, <laughs> I work for Cameo. You know, this week, I talked to like Huggy Bear from Starsky and Hutch, and yeah. Yeah. and then Butterbean put me with Anthony Ruiz Jr., the world champion. Boss put me <laughs> with Dan Henderson, MMA legend. Just pouring them onto the platform, having fun, connecting with people, and just uh, being sane and stable. Which I know sounds boring, but I'll take it. Nice, I'll see you, boss. I went to a wedding. Uh, well, actually, an engagement, a surprise engagement from my buddy Alex. And uh, I don't know how he kept it under the, you know, so, so his uh, future wife, thankfully, she said yes, actually. Uh, how he kept it for two or three months, he was saying this thing. Over 200 people, nobody said it would. It was really amazing. He arranged something for me. So I don't have a lot of boxing gloves, side boxing gloves, but this is the latest from the Marty Chukabowski, actually, the boxer, a really good boxer. He got me this one. This is Pac Man. And Errol Spence Jr. on one yes, call. Yes. And then I have on this one, Roberto Duran and Triple right. G. Whoa! <laughs> oh my God. So uh, I was very stoked with that. So, yeah, it's been a fun trip. I'm happy to be home. And uh, I'm going to show you this uh, this hey, boss, week. Boss, yeah. Paul Sykes, uh, our friend Paul Sykes, he's asking, how do you rate Shamrock? And I don't know if he means Ken or Frank, but I'm going to say Frank. No, I'm going to say Ken by the question. How do you rate Shamrock when you fought him? He was in incredible shape and at his prime. And let's keep in mind that three weeks from now, Ken Shamrock is guesting live with us right here on Talking Tough. Boss? Yes. I, want to show, I want to show Boss this. This boss, nice. Muhammad Ali. Oh, oh, you, man. Uh, I don't have that. You, I wish that I would have met him. Gee, so bad. I have to. But anyway, um, Ken Shamrock. So Ken Shamrock, um, well, at the time when I fought him, I didn't have my sub submission skills yet. But he was the catalyst that made me, uh, because I'm a very sore loser, just say, okay, I either learn this game or I'm going to quit this game. It's one of the two. So, But because I didn't like the ground, somehow I didn't like it. So I stopped focusing, focusing. Maybe I haven't said it already on this uh, podcast. I don't know. But I kept going, and I, I suddenly I fell in love with it. I became obsessed with it. I mean, I would wake up in the middle of the night, wake my wife up, and put her in a submission because I would dream a certain submission. It, it would go crazy. 
And man, so you know everything. When you once you love it, you do it a lot. And once you do it a lot, you automatically become good. I won my for my last fight. I lost my submission. I won my next eight by way of submission, wow. and I actually never lost a fight again. So uh, I always wanted to fight Ken one more time, and unfortunately that didn't happen. I was trying it to, to do when he came to prize fighting championships, but uh, he had different plans. He said so, but uh, and yes, I, I I think what he's doing right now to keep fighting because he loves it. I said, why do you do it? You're tarnishing your career, and he says, I just love the whole feeling, everything about it. And hey. Who am I to judge on that, you know? But it's just uh, for me to see his record now, while he was such an incredible animal in the beginning, that, that kind of hurts me a little bit. But uh, like I said, he's doing what he loves to do. So it's all what he likes to do and good power to him. He, he, he is doing it. You know, Ken, and I'll say it here and I'll admit it. I'll admit I said it when he comes on. Ken's a madman. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And, uh, and he's going to be here with us November the 3rd. So uh, everybody out there, Ken Shamrock, here on Talking Tough, November the 3rd. Stay tuned. That's going to be a good one, man. Yes. Yeah, we'll actually be with Ken, I think, next weekend at a show. So I'll kind of I'll, – I'll see I'll see what he thinks about you behind the scenes, boss, before we talk. <laughs> He's a good guy. He's a good guy. I always like him. We always could uh, – we, we went along really well, also in Japan. So Let, Let's guy. torque it up, Bean. Let's get some heat going here, Bean. We need it. Um, you know, boss, I hope you don't mind that, that I share this, but – Boss and I talked yesterday. I was on a call with JBL. Now, for people who are not familiar with JBL, he was a WWE heavyweight champion, played the big Texan like JR from Dallas gimmick. And there was a little bit of public heat between JBL and Boss Rutten. And it's not heat that JBL wanted, mind you. Behind the scenes, he is considered the toughest guy in WWE. Being you know him from your brawl for all days. Of yeah, course. I kind of I kind of washed all them guys up pretty quick, though. I'm sure you did. And there's a question for ah. you on brawl for all. We'll come back to that in a minute. But we're talking about now. There there was an issue with Mauro Ronaldo, a friend of mine, but a much better friend of bosses, great announcer who publicly has suffered from mental health very publicly. And I know we've all, Sean, I'm not sure about you, sir, but I know we've all had our, most of had our challenges. And publicly, <laughs> supposedly, G- on, come on, huh? <laughs> Bean, we're both crazy. It's okay, man. Um, so Supposedly, JBL put Mauro Ronaldo in a really bad place and sent him into a depression. And Boss came to his defense publicly. I spoke with JBL yesterday. He's like, Rick, that's all wrong. It's not true. I said, why don't you come on our show and talk about it? And he said, if boss would have me, I would love to. So I'm thinking, boss, do we bring JBL on the show? 100 percent because you know, this is what we always should do. You know, we 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 always we judge if we hear something from one side, you know, and it's great to hear from both sides. And I think this thing can be worked out. And God knows that he and Mauro, you know, are gonna be cool again, you know. So it can only help. So yes, please. Great. You know, if we could bring Moro on too, that would be amazing, man. I would love to have Moro on. That would be that would be fantastic. Yeah. But with that, and I'm pretty sure that if that's possible, if we can put two together at the same time on, maybe that will be good. Maybe we should interview JBL first. <laughs> yes. See what he has to say. Exactly. And then we bring Moro on. You look, because Moro, yes. he's not to stop. You know, if he starts, he starts also. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Lucky. I'll tell you that our our, wi- our two wizard producers behind the curtain here, Rachel Sartoris and John Paz, they'll they'll make that happen for us. We'll get it all worked out. So nice. oh, I had a question somebody asked here on Rick about me fighting Larry Holmes, uh, Scott Burke. You know, Larry was he was terrified. I mean, he run the whole fight, Scott. I mean, you would think you'd want to prove, you know, because one of his later fights, you want to prove that he could dominate a four round fighter in a 10 round fight, but he wasn't able to. So hopefully I answered that question. <laughs> I love it. Uh, boss. Yes. Stephanie Dawn is a yoga instructor and a student of Krav Maga. She'd like to teach a class that incorporates yoga with various aspects of martial arts. What's your advice on combining those two practices? I think it's great. I think, uh, you know, to being relaxed as a fighter is the most important thing there is. You know, aggression has no home, so to say, in fighting because it makes you, emotions make you make mistakes. That's it. You know, you want to leave the emotions home. You want to use the emotions in training so because then you can't go harder. But once you're fighting, you need to be completely relaxed. So I think that 
is a really great thing. I don't know how you can combine it with, but I, I guess stretching, really great stretching routines that you can use for kicking for the shoulders, for mixed martial arts, yoga for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think it's a, it's a great combination, yeah. I like that too. Stephanie, when it happens, let us know. Maybe we'll all get together and uh, and take a class with you. That would, that would be fun. And, uh, and Bean, I still want to see you. Doing, I mean, our good friend Diamond Dallas Page, who we will have on as a guest. I mean, some reason he's supposed to send me the info, but he never does. All right, DDP, I'm if you're out there, Bean. Stephanie, be come teach me. <laughs> but listen, the yoga that he does, DDP yoga, it's re I really like it. It's I'm doing it also, so uh, yeah. it's it's not a not a trick. It's not a thing. It's 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 really working, and the story behind it is amazing, also. All right. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna potentially publicly embarrass here, but I'm gonna try it. Uh, our producer John Paws is behind the curtain. John, do me a favor, please, while we're on, text DDP and see if you can pull him up for a second. Because we need to connect uh, Bean and DDP here live. If we can find them. If not, we'll have I them on as a guest. I'm going to the show with him coming up pretty soon also, Rick. So I'll get with him and I'll get all my stuff and, and start doing yoga. But I have been <laughs> yeah. the next couple months we're doing a show together. Absolutely. We, Make sure we you have a really camera on that yoga. I want to see this. Sean, <laughs> how, how about you, Sean? Are you – um? Uh, you're an athlete. I mean, you know, a lot of people, and don't take this the wrong way, would say just a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. But I know that you're not that um, stereotype of what people would perceive. W what do you do to stay in the shape that you're in at this point in your life? Well, I mean, I'm surprised you even said that. I'm not doing anything to stay in shape. I exercise, but I'm, uh, I, you know, it's calories in, calories out. I like to eat. If you go down my Instagram feed, you'll see um, I'm, I should be a, a food channel. I like to eat food, so I go to the gym and I exercise. And I say that very deliberately. I trained for the better part of my life. And when I retired, I realized that the only way I'm going to get hurt or only way I'm going to get injured is if I continue to train. But uh, when I give seminars, I, I liken it to, to people that go, oh, you know, we need you to look like you used to. I mean, there's a mo we all have a moment in time. We have a season. And when that season goes, you got to move into the next phase of life. Um, can you imagine you play in the NFL for 10 years? And then uh, you retire and you see that football player who's retired, hasn't played in, in five years. You see him, you know, running routes with his football helmet on and his cleats. And, you know, this is bodybuilding was something I did and I got paid to do as a professional. When it was over, you know, I had to bring the testosterone down and, and, and make it a marathon, not a sprint. I don't have anything to prove to anyone. I don't need to go in there and, and lift so much heavy weight. I don't have to look a certain way. I go to the gym to exercise to feel a certain way. And when I do that, I don't, I'm not in harm's way. Uh, I'll use the boxing analogy with Butterbean. Um, I wouldn't want to be his sparring partner because if he, if he spars the same way he fights, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. Because for me, I know when I was bodybuilding, there was no practice. I was bodybuilding. If you're coming to the gym, you're going to get your ass kicked, or at least I'm going to try to. And the end game is that you fight back so I get my ass kicked, right? So the harder I train, the harder my training partner trains. Now, in retirement, I don't want to go in the gym like that. Because if I go in the gym like that, I just have these fears of tearing a hamstring, tearing a bicep, you know, injuring a shoulder, maybe a hip or a knee. And these are things that are going to carry me into my old age. I don't want to start breaking down as I get further and further along in age. So I dumb it down. I exercise. I move stuff around. But I'm not looking at how much weight uh, I'm pushing. And I'm not going there to, 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 to look a certain way. I'm going in there to feel a certain way. Awesome. Th Sean, thank you, man. I, I was curious, and I meant to ask you offline, but I appreciate you letting us, us all know. That's food for thought, and I'm going to hit you up on that later, if you don't mind. So I won't yeah, can, can I ask a question, uh, Sean? Because I, I mean, how do you get it out? Because, I mean, the, the way you guys are look like, the, we're talking about professional bodybuilding. It's a complete different story than when you see other guys. So the rest, that needs to be the DNA thing. <laughs> that needs to be that. Is that something you discovered early on that you say, oh, man, I'm, I'm growing much harder than, than a regular person would do? How did yeah. you get pulled into that? I think you don't really look sideways, right? You look at something that impresses you, and uh, there's a feeling that comes over you. I imagine I wrestled, too, my sophomore year, and I thought it was too hard. Like, I didn't I – wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. That was hard. Wrestling was hard. Running around yeah. with a football, to me, was easy. But it's hard for a guy that's a swimmer, right? So yeah. when I started lifting weights, I found something that I could control. I can control going up five pounds, 10 pounds. 
I can control uh, looking and feeling a certain way by training harder. I couldn't look at someone. It doesn't rub off. Uh, I yeah. got motivated by people that were further developed than I was and, and guys that were in places I wanted to be when I saw the bodybuilders with the cute girls or, or the bodybuilders on the covers of the magazines or the photographers or even just the adulation. When a bodybuilder walked into a room, you knew it was a bodybuilder. All the, all the heads would turn. You can't see that when you have a wrestler walk in the room. You, I mean, yeah. you might see it with a basketball player, but not, you know, you're talking the sinners. You're not talking about the guards and, the, you know, the shooting guards. But a guy seven feet tall walks in a room, everybody's going to notice that. Well, in my universe, uh, a bodybuilder walked into the room. You looked, and I, I kind of was attracted by that. And the more I, more uh, acknowledgments I got, the harder I trained. And I fed the machine. Yeah. You start learning what food to eat. You start learning how far you can push your body. And then you get challenged by guys that are bigger and better than yourself. And then you wake up, and there you are. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a love story for me. I fell in love with it as soon as I got on stage. Man, from Sean Ray, one of the top bodybuilders of all time. That's amazing, man. Thank you. Uh, Rachel is beating me up off screen. It's time for us to go to the next segment because we are being organized now. We're trying. We're doing a pretty good job for four bald guys, I think. Um, I, I want to explain to everybody out there what Talking Tough is all about. It's a show where we essentially do two things. We want to tell what we call war stories. I mean, when you see Butterbean, when you see Sean Ray, when you see Boss Rutten, you expect to hear stories about what happened, you know, in the ring, in the cage, on the stage, and, and behind the scenes. We call those war stories, and you will hear all of that. And then where does the name Talking Tough come from? I mentioned up front, you don't judge a book by its cover. And I know you've already got, I can see from the comments, these are very evolved guys here. My friend Sean and Bean and Boss. You know, they've been through it. They've come out the other side. They're very evolved. Talking tough is talking about being at the bottom, you know, the, the very bottom of your pit of despair, what it was like, what they did to get out of it. Are they out of it now? Are they still working their way out of it? And what advice, if any, we can impart to help other people out there who might be experiencing the same thing. So we are going to go to that talking tough segment in just a moment. And Rachel, don't get mad at me. I have to ask one more question. It's nothing to do with this. Butterbean. Nigel keeps saying, what happened backstage after you beat up uh, Bart Gunn? How did the wrestlers treat you backstage at WrestleMania? It, it was like, you know, most of the guys honestly thought I was going to lose. Um, Stone Cold, he, I remember him mostly. He come in my dressing room probably 10 times, jumping up down, looking at me going, you're a badass! <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes later, he come back. He done that maybe ten times, which, man, it was it was a great feeling. I mean, I I didn't ever want to like become a pro wrestler because for me, the money wasn't there. Yeah, unless like, you hit it big, 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 and I, and that there was too many at that era, too many big, big, big names already. So I wanted to keep fighting because I was making really good money doing it. But to get the respect out of some of the big guys in in the field, it really felt really good. That's that's cool. I could see I could totally picture Stone Cold uh, doing that with you. And we're trying we're probably going to have Steve on as a guest before long. But one other segment I'm talking to is we are going to have guests starting next week. And we don't know who next week's guest is yet. But the following week, we have a fellow bald is beautiful buddy when Kurt Angle is going to join us on uh, two weeks Great. from today. So everyone nice. stay tuned. Uh, Kurt Angle two weeks from today. That will be awesome. Uh so, talking tough time, man. Falling to the bottom, fighting your way back out of the pit. And uh, if you don't mind, Sean, I would love to put you on uh, the spot this week. And uh, please, wisdom, if you don't mind. Well, if we take it back a bit, uh, I believe it was the 1988 Olympic Games when we saw um, Ben Johnson run a 986 World Championship 100 meter run. And I think it was Seoul, Seoul Korea, I think it was. Uh, when he failed the drug test after winning that gold medal and was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, it said banned. And uh, he pretty much wore the scarlet letter for failing a drug test. And uh, Carl Lewis was kind of like the darling afterwards by default, even though he didn't beat J uh, Ben Johnson. But um, later we come to find out that Carl Lewis tested dirty five or six different times. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole steroid movement began. It got a, a groundswell uh, the WWE started testing for it with Vince McMahon. Uh, we started having the, the baseball players and the football players were getting all huge. And I think there was something going on with uh, some government regulations. And 
they wanted to stamp out the steroid use. Well, lo and behold, it came into the bodybuilding industry. And in 1990, the very first ever drug-tested bodybuilding show would take place at the Arnold Classic, which actually happens this Saturday night in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this, this would have been 30 years ago, 31 years ago in 1990, that I went into that drug-tested competition after winning the Pro Ironman here in Redondo Beach two weeks prior. That would qualify me for the 1990 Mr. Olympia. Two weeks later, I'd go to the Arnold Classic in Columbus, Ohio, and win with perfect scores and walk off with the biggest purse of $60,000 at the time presented to me by Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. Then I'd go on tour for two weeks over to, um, to Toronto, Canada. Uh, while I was in Toronto, Canada, I received the phone call that I failed the, ster the steroid test, tested positive. Um, and that being said, they held on to all the prize money until the test results came in, so I didn't have the $60,000. But what I did have was the Arnold Classic Trophy, second one of its kind. It started in 1989. Rich Gaspari won the first one, walked off of $55,000, and there I was, 24 years old, the new darling of bodybuilding, um, planning on buying a house and had big dreams and big goals at 24 years old. And I was told I wasn't going to get the check, but I would have to return the trophy, which meant I'd have to go to my mom's house, take it from her mantle off the fireplace, Ooh. drive it down to Gold's Gym, and leave it in Gold's Gym, Venice Beach, where they would then deliver it to Mike Ashley, who, who was called The Natural uh, in, in Arizona. And Mike Ashley um, had portrayed himself as a lifelong natural bodybuilder, so stood the reason that when he got second place to me, uh, by my default, that he would be elevated to the champion. So while I'm on tour, I don't know really what's going to happen. I don't know. Is this the end for me? I failed the drug test, right? But this is, this is an age of no digital communication. Um, that information did not hit the public newsstands until around the month of May or June. And by that time, I had already continued on training. I'd met with Joe Weider. I was already qualified for the Mr. Olympia. And all he could say is, you're qualified for the Olympia. Don't make that mistake again. Otherwise, it's curtains. The Mr. Olympia was going to be drug tested. Just so happens in 1990 in Chicago, September, it was also where Vince McMahon launched his brand new WBF Bodybuilding Federation and walked off with 13 IFBB pros, one of which was Barry DeMay from the Netherlands, um, Gary Stridham, uh, Aaron Baker, Mike Quinn, Jim Quinn, Mike Christian, David Durth, Danny Padilla, Tony P uh, Pearson, and my former training partner, Troy Zuccolato. They all left to the WBF for guaranteed contracts. Um, while the Mr. Olympia was taking place in 1990. And I'm there. And I have this time they get it backwards. They do the drug testing on Friday, and they get the drug test back on Friday. So the only way to get on the stage is if you pass the test. I happen to pass the test. And, of course, going on to that competition the, the following night, I wound up going from 13th place in, in 1988 all the way up to third place in my second Mr. Olympia. I got to keep the prize money. And the only way I felt I could redeem myself after passing that test and getting the prize money was to go back to Columbus, Ohio. So in 1991, I went back to Columbus, Ohio, increased the prize money to $70,000. And at 25 years old, I duplicated the feat of winning in 1990, kept the $70,000, got the Arnold Classic Trophy, which is right here over my head. I'm going to show you real quick. I don't know if you can see it. You see that? <laughs> can you see the trophy? That's from 1991. Yeah. It's the 1991 Arnold Classic Trophy, and um, I redeemed myself because at that, at that point in time, um, they got rid of all the steroid testing. Lo and behold, what happened? In one <laughs> year, they threw all the drug tests out. I'll tell you why. The, in 1990, when I failed the test, there were six other bodybuilders that failed the test. At the Mr. Olympia, there were six other bodybuilders that failed the test if they were going to continue doing what they were trying to do in the sport of bodybuilding they're ultimately going to wind up with no bodybuilders yep. because there's different functions. When you say the word steroids, everybody thinks a needle and a syringe. But if you think of steroids the way you think of automobiles, you will now know that there is a whole range of choices, just like there are with cars. Sean, I, Sean you, you know me. I'm obnoxious. I'm the interrupter, and I'm going to do it. I'm digging in, and I'm going to go another okay. direction, man. I'm sorry. You said... I don't, I, we'll save the education on anabolics for another time, and I would love that. Okay. I want to ask you this. You said you need you needed to redeem yourself. Yes. Well, what does that mean? Now, you got caught. I get it. 
You redeem your, well, you redeem yourself because you came back and won the next year. But what was what was happening in your brain and in your heart when you had to go into your mother's home and take that trophy off the mat? I want to know how you felt and how you dealt with that. Yeah, it was a hard one because uh, my mom didn't know what steroids were. She didn't know what the whole thing was. She she was more concerned about the fact that she had gone house shopping with me. I knew I was going to win the contest. She was there two weeks prior when I wanted at the Ironman. And we were going to pretty much duplicate what happened in Redondo Beach in Ohio against pretty much the same lineup with a few different people thrown in. But I was confident I was going to win, and so was she. And uh, by not being able to keep that prize money, I wasn't able to buy the house that I was trying to buy. I was planning on it. My mom had gone to help pick it out with me. So that's the thing called counting your chickens before they hatch. And so uh, my redemption came from the fact that Joe Weider was very understanding, reminding me that – I was still qualified for the Mr. Olympia and I still had an opportunity to pass a drug test. It wasn't like, I felt like I was Ben Johnson, the bodybuilding, but I also know in my psyche that almost everyone else was doing it. Um, I didn't justify my use of that, but it's just, it's the sport of bodybuilding. And there are things that you can do that you get on at a certain time and you get off at a certain time. There's water-based anabolics. I, I was just trying to say, Rick, in, in talking about anabolics, there's so many different varieties that they don't just come in a needle and a syringe. And it's not just for the advantage of being big. Because again, I was one of the smaller guys. Um, there's things that you use for recovery, things that you use for hardness, things that you use for definition and muscle retention. But it, it, was a, it was a long walk into my mom's house, to that fireplace, explaining to her that I was a loser, feeling like a loser. And mind you, I was the only one that could deliver that trophy to Gold's Gym, a place I was celebrated in a place that I trained regularly, in a place that they did not know what the hell I was doing. The gym manager knew. But when I brought the trophy in and sat it down, most people thought I was showing it off for a little while because it sat there for about a week. And I was there, in and out of the gym. There was the Arnold Classic trophy. In the Gold's gym, when you check in to register, you can see the trophy. And then it was gone. And I have to come in there, and I've got to explain to people because it's not circulating at the rate that we communicate today. Yeah. The only way you know is if you called Gold's Gym for the results or if somebody told you, and it was snail mail. So m half the people thought I was still the Arnold Classic champion. I know this is Rick's kind of spot, but my view is how that make you feel like, did you go into depression or did you, I mean, how did you cope that? I mean, because me, I didn't curl up in the bed for a month. I wouldn't have wanted to go nowhere. I'll be honest with you. I'm yeah, just, I got to tell you, Butterbee, you cope with that? There, was no, there was no depression. There was getting right back to work. I was I had a tour that I had already arranged uh, prior to the Arnold Classic that was taking me around the world up until September, almost August, I should say. So I think because I was busy and I was pre-booked and I was coming off that Arnold Classic and I was getting the affirmation from people as I was doing my seminars and appearances saying it was all bullshit, right? Like they didn't make me feel maybe like Ben Johnson felt because... I think people just kind of understand the dynamics of bodybuilding. It's a very forgiving sport if you're a bodybuilder. A lot of bodybuilders were doing what I was doing. And before the grace of God, some of us may, may not have to experience a steroid test, but there's a lot of bodybuilders that had been using it. And I don't think any of us looked at it as something that was like cocaine or freaking, you know what I mean, crack. So it was kind of a more of an acceptable drug in the 90s. And having to explain to my mom that I would be back and that I would redeem myself was tougher to, to actually make myself believe and, and actually do. So when I moved into third place in the Olympia and I passed the drug test and we knew that Friday night and I was able to call my mom and say, I passed the test. Now she says, go out and win it. Well, I'm going up against a six time Mr. Olympia, you know, Lee Haney. It's easier said than done. I got Lee yeah. LeBron in the show. I got Rich Gaspari. I can't just go out and win the Olympia. It would be nice, but I'm going out there trying to win this thing drug free. I mean, in my mind, I'm going up Mount Everest, and I don't know what these guys are going to look like, but I do know the bigger bodybuilders were not going to be as impressive drug-free. So I, in my mind, I thought, this is going to favor me going into this show because they're all going to be a lot smaller than they normally would. And I'm already small anyways, and I'm not going to be that much smaller than I was. And lo and behold, I got third place, and I was celebrated. So, Eric, before depression could set in, I got the affirmation from Joe Weider. My training partners were pushing me even harder and I had the belief that I could actually win the 1990 Mr. Olympia. By getting third place for me, that was as best I could ever do. I sailed into the 91 Arnold Classic Championships, got
got the $70,000 check, bought the house, and I got the trophy. I took it from my mom. I said, you're not getting this one. <laughs> this one's mine. Oh, thank, you. thank you, man. Re really appreciate you sharing all of that. Thank you. Yeah. And we're, we're going to deliver as promised. We have a bunch of questions to answer. Uh, but I want to ask you guys two questions first, if you don't mind. This one actually is for Sean. So we're talking a lot about anabolics. This question's out of nowhere. Don't think. I want a fast answer. John, John Cena, steroids or no steroids? Um, in his early years, I think, yeah. I think he started out trying to be a bodybuilder than a wrestler. I, I have to ask because John's very public saying that he's never used anabolics. And I, I look at his body. So I wonder, you're an expert. I was just curious what you would say. I would think something, yes. All right, cool. Question for all you guys. We're going to have guests on every week going forward. Throw out a couple of fantasy names real quickly. Boss, who should we have on the show? Oh, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm good with everybody. You know, like I, I'm the kind of guy who also says, hey, let's pitch a, a guy from the gym somewhere, an amateur fighter who just starts his career and see what why he chooses that. Because these people, will ne they never get a light, you know. And if you think about it, it could be very interesting. We don't know. You know, maybe it's a reason to play. Yeah, so maybe there could be a side podcast or something we're doing, you know, for the people. Because most of the time, everybody wants a famous person. I think JBL will be great. I think Ken Shamrock is freaking awesome to have Mauro, if he can be thrown in the mix, and I'm pretty sure we'll do it. That will be a very cool one. But, you know, actors. I got Holt McCallany, a buddy of mine. You know, he's the lead actor from Mindhunter. That's a great guy. What about Mickey Rourke? You know, maybe get, yeah, get him. Yeah, that would be really cool. That'd be really so, cool. Yeah, I got uh, I got some friends that I can ask, you know, and uh, and, and, and fighters, yeah, fighters Mickey's, galore. Mickey's you know, got some good yeah. stories. As a matter of fact, boss, uh, last time I was with uh, Mickey, I was with uh, Shamrock and um, uh, James Tony. James Tony out here in Los Angeles had a boxing thing. Uh, uh, he's a great storyteller, Mickey. He's seen it all. Yeah. No, he's been everywhere. I met him the first time, like in 2002, in uh, all the way in Japan. We went to Gonpachi. Gonpachi is that restaurant where Kill Bill was filmed. You know, the ah, big fighting scene in that restaurant. Yeah. So that was that was very bad. We went to the screening of uh, that movie, uh, Dark City. What was it again? Uh, the, the, the the black and white movie, Dark City or City of something. Anyway, it was oh, uh, Sin City. Sin City. Sin City. Yes. Sin. And yeah. uh, it was cool because he was on the stage and there was this big poster. And he and now because I was in the audience, I think he wanted to show up. So suddenly he gave that freaking <laughs> big poster a kick and it flew all over <laughs> the place. And he started laughing. Yeah, he's a funny guy, man. He's an amazing he's person. Mick, Mickey Rourke would be perfect. Let's. I'll, I will. I will make an effort for sure. I love that idea. And the amateur fighter is a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, who should we have on? Ben, who should we have on this one? He used to play football for a little bit. Brett Farr. I'm going to reach Red out Far. to him this week. Brett Favre. He's had a lot of stuff, especially with his wife having breast cancer. And uh, yeah. one time I met him doing some cancer fundraisers. And I think Brett, Brett would bring good, a good story to the, the, to the evening. Yeah. I, I think Brett would be great. I don't know him. Uh, Brett was one of the first guys on Cameo. Here comes a plug for Cameo. I just thought of it. He does great on Cameo. Uh, I would yeah, love to have him on. I'll get, hold and, I'll, I'll, I'll get the word to him. Perfect. Please do. And as long as I brought it up, I want to let everybody out there know, guess who's on Cameo? Sean Ray, Butterbean, and Boss Rutten. So you can go get them. Yeah. Amazing. There you go. Um, you Sean, guy. who should we have on as guests? Um, good question. There's so many different types of personality. Uh, I know Michael Jai White, he's got a lot of good stories. He's got a lot of history as well. Um, he's out of Arizona. Got good friends with a couple of my buddies. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, I love Ronnie Coleman. I just had Ronnie Coleman by myself. Uh, I did an interview with him and, you know, eight Mr. Olympia trophies, back surgeries, uh, quadricep injuries, hip surgeries. Ronnie Coleman's been through it all. Um, he's a good one in bodybuilding anyways. I think Ron I don't know him, but I know of him. If you could talk with Ronnie and with Michael, they'd both be fantastic, man. That would be really cool. And uh, yep. the, both would be fun. And guys, you know who I want to try to get? I want to try to get Dana White and Vince McMahon. I think that would be interesting. On the same um, show. Well, this week, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, Mr. Olympia weekend, Stephanie McMahon's getting inducted in the body in the uh, Hall of Fame, uh, shut on by Ron Goldman out at the uh, Olympia in uh, Orlando, Florida. 
I got I'm in that too. Um, I got inducted a couple of years ago. Yeah, Boss did, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a nice one. It's really nice. Very well yeah, done. I missed it because they run they run it during the show, like during the expo, and it's the timeline's all screwed up. This time I have a chance to watch it. They're gonna bring in Marcus Allen, Stephen McMahon, and a few other people. So that'll be kind of cool. I think Don the Dragon, Wilson. Oh, nice. Yeah. Don is nice. Hey boss, yeah. Libby just brought up a, a good name, a good friend of mine that would be really good for the show, Laborio. From oh Matthew. yeah. Ricardo Laborio. Real, real, I've known yeah. him for probably 35 years now. Really good guy. I, I, I really love that guy. Yeah, it was uh, I, I met him first time in uh, in uh, in China and I was rolling with some guys in the club and it was a really cool compliment because he was sitting there and he thought I was a striker and then uh and he was sitting like this. He goes like, "Holy crap!" He goes, "He said, I don't know, I, I, I don't know." So it was. I go, "Man, that's really cool coming from you." <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I impressed him to impress a guy like that because he's a phenom on the ground. That is pretty cool. Laborio, being Laborio is a great idea. Laborio is a great idea. I, I think we should uh, we should go for it. So, so his much daughter is, uh, it's, it's, it's blind, right? His daughter is blind. And she's doing jujitsu. Ah. Right. She's I, unbelievable. I probably four years or five years before his daughter is born. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a good person too, man. I really like him. Well, well so. we will uh, we will target Mr. Laborio for sure. And we also have coming up four weeks from tonight, Mick Foley. So hey. our guest lineup so far is we have Kurt Angle. We have Mick Foley and we have Ken Shamrock coming up. Good start. Aha. Sean's got the, the sock. Got what do you call it? Mr. Socko, right? Socko. Socko. That's really cool. I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to send Mick. From WrestleMania 15 for my kids. He give it to us. The Mick's a great guy. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I'm going to send. Benny Okides or Jean Claude for the win. Benny Okides. What was it? What? Okay, who's talking? We yeah, I was supposed to be in a movie with John Claude, <laughs> but his producer thought I'd overshadow him, so they, they pulled out of it. Well, you yeah, overshadow but... a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Benny Ortiz or Jean Claude Van Damme. Trust me, Benny Ortiz. He's a freaking animal, this guy. Yeah. I, saw some, I saw him fight in Holland, destroying this uh, American, uh, the Dutch guy. Everybody hated him when he came in, and after the third round, everybody it was like a Rocky movie. Everybody was cheering for him and booing the Dutch guy. It was amazing. It was, what a he flipped the whole audience. Animal. So uh, let's answer some questions. Hundred percent with you. Enough of them yet. What did you say, uh, uh, Eric? I think we should answer some qu a good bit of questions. We haven't had a chance to get to a good bit of them. Yeah. Let's let's do some questions. Yes, we, we're uh, – I've, I've noticed there's some glitches down, here. Let's get some questions out there for Pete, for us. Yes, yes, I'm looking for them, and John, John and Rachel have them have them coming for us. So while we're waiting, <laughs> while we're waiting for that, you know, while we're waiting, let's do some fantasy fight questions, Mr. Rutten, Mr. Butterbean, and Mr. Sean Ray. <laughs> um, hey, uh, Dana White versus Vince McMahon. Just kidding. That's all right. <laughs> so Who has the best physique in pro wrestling? Romanowski is asking. Best physique in pro wrestling. I like mm. the Ultimate Warrior. Ultimate Warrior was built. He was stacked. Yep. Yep. Warrior. The Ultimate Warrior had a good physique. Yes. As a matter of fact, I think he bought, I think he competed. He won the wheelchair. He did. Yeah. He was a competition bodybuilder before he uh, started training for wrestling. Yes. Yeah. Now Lex Luger also had an awesome Lex body. Luger too. Yeah, I used to work. I worked out at his gym uh, out in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia. I used to have a gym out there, Lex Luger. Uh, he's a great guy. I Sean, I don't know if you. Know, I don't know if you know this, Sean, but I uh, I discovered and trained the Ultimate Warrior back in 1985, and. Wow. Uh, I've got a warrior and sting at the same time. We all live in the same house together in Reseda yeah. in the Valley. And, uh, so I, I introduced Jim and Steve to pro wrestling. 
and, and the rest they say is, is history. It's history, and, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you some ultimate warrior stories sometimes that will like curl your toenails, man. Yeah. That was one crazy ML. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, all those wrestlers boss. were much longer, right? They're a lot taller, so they couldn't get the girth, uh, you know, that a shorter bodybuilder could. Tom Platts or myself, we're, we looked a lot bigger because we're proportionately shorter. But the taller guys, hard to pack on that weight with that height. But the, yep. the Ultimate Warrior weren't well. Agreed. So, boss, Mint, Mint Diggity is asking Diaz or Lawler. Yeah, I saw that. I mean, it's such a hard thing uh, to – you would go with Diaz. He's so durable. You yeah. know, Lawler is, though, when he connects, I mean, you can't be Diaz, but he can knock everybody out. You know, that power that he has, it's just bizarre. I remember uh, Manuf, Melvin Manuf is fighting him. I think it was a Bellator even. I, and, and, I mean, he's getting destroyed, his legs. He can't walk anymore. And Manuf gets overconfident, and he comes in with one more low kick, and he goes, poof, one punch. <laughs> Out cold and Mono is an animal. So that's the thing. I think Diaz, because he kept on fighting, I think he might win it, especially if it goes to a decision. But if there's a knockout, a stoppage, it could also uh, come in the early rounds, especially from Lawler, because he's so freaking powerful. It's a hard one. Bean, do you, of all the fights you've had, Bean, do you think you remember all the guys that you fought, or, or is it like just like this blur? It's a, I've had over 300 pro fights. It's a blur. Yeah. I've met guys that actually fought, and I said, you remember fighting me? I'm like, no. Do you remember me? Of course I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm asking because we have a question. Do you remember fighting Don Kaminsky? And my first question is, who's Don Kaminsky? I don't know that I name. Do you? I don't know, Rick. I don't remember him. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh! Uh, a Sometimes guy you do remember people. Larry Holmes. I do remember fighting Sorry, Larry Holmes. Oh no, no! Yeah. I just have so, a people. I, I, I had a person who said to me one time, and she was getting very angry because I did not recognize her. And she said hi to me four years ago before that date, at, and she was sitting behind me at King of the Cage with her husband. And then and I and I said, oh, oh, no, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. And she got offended. Yeah. Go, wow. How are you going to remember that? Right? <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible. So the trick is, if they're attractive, you always remember them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Thank you. Let them talk. Lucy, <laughs> right? Lucy. <laughs> speak, speak, speaking point. of remembering people, you know, speaking of remembering people, I have a total out of left field question. Okay, MMA, boxing, pro wrestling for sure has groupies. Sean, does bodybuilding have groupies? And what's that scene like? I, I'm dying to know. Yeah, I mean, not like we think of like a rock and roll or basketball players. I mean, listen, you got a, a lot of people in the gym training for fitness, uh, very likable type of interests, uh, probably pretty easy to meet somebody that has something in common. I met my wife in a gym. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's like girls that show up at the basketball game and are hanging out for the basketball players or entertainers, uh, you know, rock and roll stars. And they're kind of waiting for that autograph and see what they can do. It doesn't, bodybuilding didn't have the party atmosphere. Like after it's over, there wasn't that, there wasn't that, there wasn't that place you go after a bodybuilder. We're going to eat, right? So, right. I mean, you have a lot more, you have a lot of things in common when you go to the gym and there's girls there. I mean, that's, it's, that's normal, right? But at a, if you're a basketball player, you're playing with a bunch of guys in an arena, and then you go and you play in a, in a basketball arena, you have all these people waiting to be entertained, and then you go out to the clubs and you run into people that have just got done watching you play. It's a different, it's a different thing. Yep. We're you know, sorry for uh, you, man. Yeah, they, they weren't, they weren't at the steakhouse. <laughs> when the bodybuilding <laughs> show's over, <laughs> when the show's over, they're not at the steakhouse waiting for you at the, at the feeding trough. They're not sitting around. Hey, is he coming in here to Sizzler to, to eat? <laughs> like, be, Bean, I, Butterbean, I know that you and I, like, we, we'll talk pretty freely about that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and Sean, I don't, I don't still really don't know you yet, so I don't know what we're allowed yeah. to talk about, not talk about. Boss, I know you kind of keep it pretty cool these days, which is great. Um, well, I'm so just, Butter yeah, I mean, I mean Libby knows. I mean, my wife, I mean, she's, she's been around me forever, so she knows I wasn't always good. Uh, Lib Libby's the greatest. It, it, 
And I want a big shout out to Libby Ash, Miss, Mrs. Butterbean, who's just like the salt of the earth. And I, I love Libby, man. And I know she's so cool to be able to like talk with, talk to, talk around. So uh, I guess we, we can always tell those stories, Bean, right? You know, Libby knows a lot of deep, dark secrets, too. So, you know, it's, it's always good black material for her, you know? Here's a great, I love this question. Boss, I asked Tank Abbott how to escape when two or more guys corner you in a bar. He said to ask Boss Rutten. So Tank, Tank Abbott was sending <laughs> some of you well, for bar fight advice. How do you escape from two guys having you cornered in a bar? Well, that's hard. You, you, you need the description right there, you know, because if it's literally cornered and you're in the corner and they're both here, the good part is you have both in, fr them in front of you. Nobody can sneak up behind. Like in a, bi in a big fight, if a fight breaks out, that's where you fight me. It's either against the wall or in the corner because then I can at least see everybody coming. And then hopefully something is close by, like a, like a stool, a bar stool or something that you can put in between and can hold somebody away with. But most of the time, distraction you know, looking behind you and like, come, come over, come over. You know, like somebody's there and they look away and then just sprint out. That would be a smart <laughs> thing to do. That actually I used also as a bouncer one time, looking over somebody's shoulder, like very gentle, you know, like just go yeah. like this. Like, they come. And then they turn around. And as soon as they turn around, you get them in a real naked choke. You know, because if they're drunk, I always say that in the early days, I would simply choke them out. I don't want to beat them up. They, they don't know what they're doing. Why would I beat their faces in? So let put them to sleep, put the zip ties on, call the cops, and let them take away. That was my way of doing it. Yeah, so distraction is the most important. And in the case when you have nothing, yeah, looking behind you and just do very confident, like, come over. They will turn around. That's your moment to escape. Good advice. Just distract. That's great. Hey, hey speaking, of Tank, speaking of Tank Abbott and speaking of fantasy fights, who do you guys think would have won this one? Can you see that? Tank versus. Oh, we'll see you That's again. Tank. That is Tank and Butterbean faced off right there. What is Butterbean? There's no way. How is he's not taller than you, right? Yeah, he's oh, taller. Yeah. Is Tank taller than you? I don't yeah. know. Tank I didn't train my gym. That's and right. I, he used to train at Powerhouse Gym in Fountain Valley, Tank out in Huntington Beach. You used to see him all the time with Tito yeah. back when it started in the early My 90s. money is on uh, Butterbean. Yeah, the Bean. I mean, man, he's I mean got if, the you look at the, if you look at Bean's record, too, you know, you've never been knocked out also, right? You got a TKO, but well, you, the, you have never been out. Yeah, you see what I mean? And the amount of fighters that you had, including Larry Holmes and all these guys, <laughs> I mean, and then you look at your record, and then you look how many people you knocked out. I mean, it's freaking impressive, man. It really is. <laughs> Let me ask a question though. What do y'all think about Jake Paul and his brother making all the money they're making for? I mean, I don't think they're legitimate fighters. What, what is y'all view on that? I think they're great marketers, man. Listen, you got to give them props. We're living in an age where social media can make you a star, not literally overnight, but if you know how to manage it, you can get a lot of people following you. They have millions of people following them, right? So they can they can come out with a supplement product and sell, you know, a percentage. They sell 10% of the millions of people that they got. They're going to make millions of dollars. These guys are following them on this boxing. Most people tune in to see if they're going to get their ass kicked, and they're just picking the right fighters that aren't kicking their ass yet. I mean, what is it, 2-0, and 3-0? Oh, and oh? I mean, they haven't fought much, but they've yeah. created also, enough stir. Also, the commission's allowing some of the fights go on that are going on. Back in my day, same with Boss. A lot of the commissions wouldn't have approved them. But isn't this yeah. the same as – Celebrity boxing. I mean, anybody can fight anybody. I mean, I remember watching Screech fight someone. Tanya Harding was on there fighting Paula, whatever her name is from the from the president thing. Paula, whatever her, her name is. Um, but anybody can fight. Anybody can get a sanction, and it's not a fight, right? It is an exhibition. That's a demonstration. Not, that's, yep. a, that's a difference. Yeah, they're, they're actually fighting fights right now. But they're not fighting. There was nothing at stake when uh, Jake Paul and Logan Paul fought. There was no belt on the line. There was nothing. There was no prize money to be won. It wasn't a winner take all. They were guaranteed money from the percentages of sales. This is a marketing thing. No, that's what a pro fight is, though. When I fought, I never like in boxing. You never got a guaranteed winner. Very few did. If you won, you got more money. You had a set rate going in. You knew what you were going to make. You fought for a federation. That's the difference. You were in a okay. federation. And it had to be sanctioned by the state or the county or whatever. Right. This, this is an exhibition that is not even 
it's it's you know it's a money making machine. And hey, if, if Kim Kardashian got out there and fought some chick, right? Somebody calls her out. She's got two hundred million followers. I mean, and you put it on pay per view for a hundred bucks, people are going to tune in for that. Yeah. Hey, well, being, being I, I have to. When we were going through our physicals in California, Rick, that's why California wouldn't sanction. Um, Gooberhead had to just fought. Evander. Yes. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Holyfield. That, you yeah, know, California, Cal California is tighter, but I have to, I have to agree with Sean. I mean, I love the fight sport and I like to consider myself a purist and want to know who the best fighter is. But at the end of the day, man, it's business. And the, the Pauls have managed to kind of catch lightning in a bottle. Yeah. Um, you know, could Boss Rutten or Butterbean in their primes beat the Pauls? Yeah, blindfolded with your arms tied behind your back. But it's, it's business. It's like this. Maybe a bad analogy, maybe not. You probably don't know who Leela James is. If you don't, search her on Spotify later. One of the most beautiful vocalists you've ever heard in the world and very technical, blow your mind. A thousand times better than Britney Spears, who sells a thousand times more tickets than Leela wow. James. It's perfect. It's, it's, for better or for worse, it's business. So the opportunity, why not capitalize? Here's what I like to see. I like to see Jake or Logan Paul fight Amanda Nunes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that, that's a money that's maker. Gonna, but I wouldn't fight them. Uh, but but I, I'm thinking with you. They, but they do be professional. They work their asses off. They train yes. every day. I mean, it's not like they make fun of boxing. They actually show. And, and I like the last message that they gave Jake Paul afterwards. They're trying, but I think they should have to to work their way up and have 10 or 15, 20 fights before they get that kind of big payday on, on a pay-per-view. Yeah, no, but this but, is the thing. This is the thing. They bring in the five or 20 million people. That's them doing it. It's not the yeah. boxers doing it, so they control it. You know? So, yeah. And I, I thought also the story with Jake Paul afterwards when he said, listen, I used to be a bully. You know, I bully people around that this sport really put me in my place. Now I realize that I was an asshole and I, I want to change. You know, so he's talking good about boxing, brings boxing to the light. Sure, they're never going to box somebody who's really good. I mean, right. but he trains with DJ Flores. He's a buddy of mine. He's a great coach. You know, so they take this stuff serious, bring in the money, man. I mean, these guys, they were 30, 40 million bucks. Yeah. Hey, that's good. Hey guys. Those guys are making money. Somebody else asked, asked me a question about how my cardio was. Just like them guys, I worked my butt off to get good cardio. I had to run, and that's part of my problem now is why I got such a bad hip because I get out and run on the road. When you put 350-pound running, you tear shit up. And I remember I remember when you were running. <laughs> I, I can attest that Beam trained his ass off. And our producers are giving me a note. We're going to go to a little ID break, and we're going to come back with a war story. Boom. Talking Tough, the world's toughest men and women at their most vulnerable. Join Rick, Sean, Boss, and Butterbean, plus very special guests live every Wednesday, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, right at Talking-Tough.com. You can also see him on YouTube at The Hannibal TV or Rick Bassman. You can check him out on Facebook at The Rick Bassman, The Real Sean Ray, and, of course, at Boss Bruton. Also, check out Rick on Twitter and Instagram at Rick underscore Bassman. Reminder, folks, Boss, Rick, Sean Ray, and Butterbean every Wednesday night live, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific for Talking Tough. And thank you, John Paz, for that. We appreciate it. And we're going to move on. First, though, as far as special guests go, October 6th, we're going to be joined here by Kurt Angle. October 20th, Mick Foley. November 3rd, Ken Shamrock. Everyone mark your calendars, please. Looking forward to those very much. Um, and thank you, Mr. Eface, freaking legends. That's for you three guys. And I agree <laughs> wholeheartedly. Okay. War stories. Outrageous. Big. The crazier, the better. Who could be better for that than Boss <laughs> Well, this one is not going to be a super big story, but it really affected me in my life. It was actually my first fight. People, I, this, the fans who are watching right now, they heard me telling this story many, many, many times. Because that's what it was. It's a very sick kid. I had skin disease. So skin disease, I had to wear gloves. I was 
my arms every night my mother had to mummify me that's what we call it and the family would send in old bed sheets to, to you know put all the creams on me i will rip that off in the middle of the night i mean a lot of work she had with me uh, asthma attacks will be a week in bed not able to eat because i couldn't it's not a little cough like completely done you cannot <laughs> that's for 12 you know that that was really really hard to need to go to school the lap in school that's what they called me hey boss watch out if i would snap my fingers watch out your finger don't fall off or scratch my ear watch out your ear don't fall off so that went on for years and and then till i was 12 years old so from from six till 12 so the meaningful years are like from 10 till 12 every day on a daily basis everybody spelling you i was always by myself you know you slowly but surely you get really aggravated everybody pointing fingers and then I saw a Bruce Lee movie, and that changed my life. And that took me two years to convince my parents to allow me to do martial arts. And finally, they allowed me after two years of begging. They broke, and I was taken under the wing by this adult, and I went to adult classes. And from that moment on, everything went really fast. And I mean, in months, I was beating some of the adults. Of course, not the big ones, but I was dropping adults as a kid. And I heard these adults talking about me in the dressing room. And of course, when you only hear bad things about you from other kids, but adults say, man, this kid got a lot of talent. He just dropped Jack with the back kick to the body. Did you see that? People laughing. You know, I go, okay. So I started listening and I realized I had some talent. And then I got into the biggest fight for me at that time was with Chucky. That was his name. And he was the biggest bully in my school. Bad family. His brother was in jail for robbery. It was just bad people. And uh, and he sure enough, he sets up with six of his body screaming at me. Hey, boss, watch out. Something doesn't fall off. It's all, always something about leprosy. And this time I shouted something back. And I heard them laugh, and I looked back, and sure enough, they took a spin, and they started to chase me. And I told myself, that's not going to happen. I put my bike on the stand, and I was just waiting for them. They surrounded me with their, with their bikes. You know, in the movies, it's always with the cars <laughs> and the headlights. <laughs> are lighting. With me, it was bicycles during the day. And then Shaki came, and he started bouncing his chest in my hand. He told me, come on, leper, hit me. And so I, and I, I did what he, what he asked me to do, and I knocked him out. It was one punch. It was, it, was, it was an amazing thing. Boom, he was out. It was noses flat on his face. There was a problem. Everybody's freaking out. Not his real friends. That's why I found out those weren't his real friends. They were just afraid of him, and that's why they joined him. And uh, the problem was that he broke his nose, had to go to the doctor, and, of course, that the police was called, and they showed up at my mom and dad's force that lost them, and it immediately took me off of martial arts because saying it was violence. Now, I told I 100% guarantee they would have kept me lost. But what I learned from that lesson was because it was the first time I was standing up for myself. I took so much crap, and 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 at that moment, everything came in that one punch. It was so easy, and it looked so easy. And now I became the bully guy. Like somebody yeah. bullied another person in school, guess who took care of that guy? You know, I start going after everybody, and I felt <laughs> had a really good feeling for it. Debo. But uh, on the other side of the story, I think that guy uh, also I taught him a lesson. You know, because those guys they don't speak language; they speak violence. And the yeah. only way to do something against the person is if talking didn't work. Tried me; I, I tried that for nine years, but one punch. Sold the whole deal. So always I get these. I was the fitness guru for Cartoon Network. I did the anti-bullying campaign. And, you know, when they ask me, oh, you cannot say that you knocked them out. I said, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I tried that. I tried it for nine yeah. years. It never worked. One punch, did work. And guess what? That guy didn't bully anybody anymore. I taught him a lesson. Because it always builds up. It gets more and more. We were talking about it last week, um, Rick, about that uh, famous guy who was challenging me at the airport, right? And he tried to intimidate me, He's standing next to me, like at all hit with his corner man. They were looking at me. And I'm standing there and I go like, and everybody was afraid of this guy. And he bullied everybody. Big stories about this guy. But he had never somebody call his bluff. And I realized we're at an airport. There's no weapons. That means you're going to lose, dude, because I'm not going to lose your ass. So I turned and I put my nose against his nose, touched him. And I've never seen anybody back down so fast. I mean, literally, I'm there like, are you guys serious? Like, nothing? You got nothing? And even people start laughing in the row. I guarantee you, after that story, that person probably didn't bully people anymore because now he knows how, how it's felt. If they yeah. don't get stopped, they only get more and more and more because they feel more strong and more strong. Somebody has to put him down in his place, and at that moment, you change his life for the better because he can also find a kid that does this, poof, and shoots him in the face. To yeah. me, it was just me intimidating him. So I think both parties are helped. And unfortunately, sometimes violence is the only language they speak. 
you have to use violence back, only more violence because then they, you teach them a lesson. So that's the big take up that I have. You always, the, the, the junkie or the, the addict, it doesn't matter. When do you start learning? When do you stop? Is when they say when you hit rock bottom, right? Now the only way is to come up, and that's the same with the bully. He's here on a high, on a high, on a high, poof. And now suddenly he's back on the low, realizes, oh, crap, I did that to other people. Now you know how it feels. Cause and effect. And I think it teaches a lot of people. So I'm all about beating people up uh, if they are bullying you. Warn them before. I say, listen, this is going to be a fight. But, uh, yeah, I, I have no problem with that. Fighting with the hands, right? No weapons, no shooting, you know. But the high school shootings, we talk about that, you know. People go like, oh, that's stupid. I, don't. I can completely understand that. I can completely understand that. Uh, do I condone it? Of course I condone it. But there was a moment in my life that I remember, and I, maybe I told this on the story. Did I tell this here when I swinged at the tree? was swinging with the yeah, fighters. Yeah. So, so kids go boom, right? And it broke, and then I went home and got a knife. And my mother saw me, thankfully, on the street with a knife, and she started to chase me. She caught me before school, because my school was 300 yards away from my home. And she got me. And until this day, I don't know what I would have done, but I think I would have... I, I was so, it was, everything came out and it, it was so, I can 100% guarantee somebody shooting somebody. It's wrong, I know. But I mean, you get pushed to a certain limit and suddenly it's the drop that makes the bucket flow and that's it. You lose control and then you go. You know, it doesn't matter anymore what happens. And uh, that's the part I never want to be again at because well, that was very short. You're, you're obviously not advocating violence or losing control. I can hear that. Yeah. Um, and I know you're not. I know that. So and if you don't mind, I kind of would like to tell you my, my bully experience in a moment because I'm wondering where you were when I was 13 years old and needed you. You were probably eight, so not much you could have done, but um, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, boss, someone's getting bullied. What's – dude, what do they do, man? It's they do? No, yeah, knowing that it's, it's only the, – they're their, their rocking year, so to say. It's only four years in school. That's it. From that moment on, because – it's proven their IQs are lower, you know. Of course, there's exemptions, but the most of them, they're not smart people. They come from a broken home, realize that they come from a home where probably violence is a, is a thing, and that's why they're doing it. They just look at things when they see the father beating the mother. Well, that's the way to settle problems. They automatically start doing that. So knowing that, that there's something going on with the bully as well, you know, that might give you a little bit of a soft spot and not to do a, a crazy thing, but... I mean, go. You have to ask parents. You have to. Uh, you have to tell your parents. And you don't want to do this because I didn't want to do this. But that was also because I was, you know, already a trouble kid with all the creams and all that stuff. But go to an adult and say, "Listen, this is just not working." But the problem nowadays in school is when a bully kids, uh, when a kid bullies a kid, and you call the parents in, the kid are siding with the with or the parents are coming up for the kids, yeah. you know, because that's where they got the violence from. You know, and now suddenly they go, no, you know, like if my daughter is wrong, she's wrong. I don't care who you are. You're wrong. You're wrong. Uh, if I find out they bully somebody, oh, well, they know my story. It will never happen because they, they're not going to be happy. I can tell you that. So getting help from an adult and hopefully otherwise uh, call uh, the A team, the team that we have right here. And maybe we come by <laughs> and then, uh, we'll talk to the kids in school. What about that? Larry Medina just wrote boss handing out free lessons. And I, I, I got to say this, man. I mean, boss, we've been good friends for a long time, but I got to like step back and be a fan there for a minute. Because again, as I said earlier, like in my mind, you were slash are the toughest guy to walk this earth. I really believe that. Mm. And we just got advice from Boss Rutten on bullying. That's pretty up and cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, thank not, you. not that tough. But can, can, can I share my weird bully story just to bore you guys for a second? Yes, please. I'd love, I'd love to do this. It's kind of weird. So, I was 13 years old and my mother, who was the closest person in the world to me, she died very suddenly, shockingly out of nowhere. And I was a mess. Didn't really know how to deal with it. My dad had to go work. He, we had no money. He had to go on the road to pay the bills. Left me and my brother on our own. He didn't abandon us. He was a good dad. So we kind of became little, little junior criminal masterminds, started taking drugs, 12 and 13, doing a lot of drinking and whatnot. Now, my mom, when she was alive, she was a big larger than life character. She would always like to try kind of like experimental stuff with us, like take us to the Braille school for the blind. One day we'd have to wear blindfolds the whole day. She would do cool stuff like that. Yeah. So my mom thought 
we grew up Jewish. We're not religious, but we grew up in a Jewish household. My mom thought it'd be a cool social experiment to enroll her Jewish son in an all Catholic school. So, <laughs> I, okay. yes, exactly. So you already know what's coming, right? So, <laughs> right, exactly. Three months after my mom dies, and I'm very shell shocked over my mom. I never dealt with it. There was no therapy in 1975 or whatever okay. it was. I go to this school just fried about my mom being gone. My dad, nicest guy in the world, wasn't emotional, didn't really know how to deal with things. I get to the school. I realized two things on the very first day. I'm the only non-Catholic in the entire school, and I'm also the shortest kid in the school. Not the shortest boy, the shortest kid, the girls included. <laughs> the girls. <laughs> Great start, right? Great start. So I'm standing there like a deer in the headlights, big kid. At least to me, he was big then. Peruvian guy named Michael Darwin. I'll never forget him. Yeah. He walks up to me and goes, you Jewish? And I'm like, yeah. And guys, boom, right cross, just laid me out right on the ground. And um, so that was the first day of seventh grade. Wow. And from that day on, and, and, and I see Bean kind of like smiling and going, where's this going? I, I in no way believe I'm a tough guy like you guys are. But I want the story is just so out there, I have to tell it. So that first day, I got knocked out. First time I've ever been hit in the head. I fought every single day that first year in school, sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day. So when you say I fought 200 times in a year, it sounds like a bullshit exaggeration, but it was defense. And this is the mid seventies. There were new, no adults to go to. My dad was on the road. I'm in a Catholic school. The brothers, the fathers, they all look the other way. You know, mm -hmm. kids playing in a playground, that's, that's okay, right? It's not, but anyway, about a couple months in, I started swinging back. No, no idea how to throw, right? That's how I threw punches back then. A little better now. Uh, so anyway, I started winning some fights. And then I realized, and I, there's a happy ending of this. I have to tell it because there's always, if you, if you look forward enough, there's always a chance to come out of it, I think. I started winning some fights. And then I realized one day I'm kind of becoming popular, oddly enough. So the end of the school year comes up and they hold the student body elections. There's only four offices in the whole school. It's a small school. So to perpetuate the stereotype of being Jewish, I decided to run for student body treasurer, of course. And <laughs> I, I, know, right? treasurer. So I had to do it. I, did, I don't know if you realize the irony at the time, but I get it now for sure. Yeah. So they're going to announce the, the results that night at the dance, the end of year dance. So three things happened that night. One I was announced as the winner of student body treasurer. Two, I beat the shit out of Michael Darwin. And three, I made out with Debbie Sanders, the hottest girl in school in front of the entire student body. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. Who says that uh, that violence doesn't pay, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's all Turned, turned out know. okay. Turned out okay, but no, I don't. I don't advocate fighting on the schoolyard. That's not, not what I'm getting at for sure. Oh okay. man, that was funny. The the, oh, <laughs> the treasury guy. You met you. Student body treasurer, like baby. <laughs> Countdown money, boss. Paul Sykes wants to know: Have you ever, have you ever been intimidated by anyone? And let's say past the time you came through being picked on. Has anybody ever intimidated you? Well, um, you know, there is this real thing with me. Yeah, it, I will be intimidated, but I am a very, I have a thing over me. Like I never lost a street fight. You know, I have this thing that I shoot in a bubble, which I have in a fight also. It's really weird. I'm completely cut off from the outside world. Don't get me wrong. I hear exactly what you're saying, but I the only focus is on that. And, and once something becomes really bad, I just trust that feeling. You know, that's why I have these weird things. Like I can see six guys do something to somebody like a kid or a woman or whatever. I'll go in there, you know. And then I, while I'm walking over, I was taking talking to the show. I go like, why am I doing this? I'm literally thinking to myself, why am I doing this? You know, but then I, I just trust the feeling because if I'm right, that means if I, uh, if I'm, uh, how do you say it? If I'm not bad, but I'm doing this for the good, I cannot lose. 
That's what I always thought. And since I never lose for a quick for a fight, I never, I only do it for pure defense. Like people say, oh, you've been in so many street fights. I haven't been in so many street fights. And you have to understand that if, if I'm in a street fight, I try to diffuse that at least five times. That's how I am all the time. And then once suddenly it goes, that's when the drop hits the bucket again. And then suddenly I go, oh, wait a minute. Or they start, then I see that they believe that I'm afraid because I don't want to fight. And then I tell them, I say, whoa, whoa, wait. You don't believe I'm afraid, right? I'm afraid for you. That's Ooh. what we're doing here right now because I will stomp your head. You see, and then it starts. Then I get into this thing. And then most of the time they back off. If they don't back off, yeah, then there is a fight. You know, so uh, and that didn't happen a lot. If I had like 35 fights and I was a bouncer, I would really love, but there's these stories that I had 200 street fights. I come on, man. I need anger management with a <laughs> record like that. <laughs> Or you have to be a short Jewish kid in a Catholic school for that to happen. They got to be. So, but you see, in your case, I bring a baseball bat. That happens to me with all these big guys. I'll well, bring a baseball bat. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a little bit opposite of uh, both of you guys because being a bodybuilder, uh, I know the fragility of getting injured. Um, you know, a black eye, a broken wrist, uh, an injured ankle. There's no more bodybuilding. You're on the sidelines. Like, it was my moneymaker. Four years out of high school, I was professional. And then, uh, you know, you get a mortgage and a car payment. And the only way that you're going to survive is by staying away from fights. I didn't run from fights. I saw fights all around me. But I was the great negotiator when it came down to people trying to challenge me. Uh, the last thing I want to do when I'm out and some guy, like you said, boss, has been drinking and you're sober, you know, I, I was the diffuser. Uh, you know, it's, it's pointing out the hot chick in the club or, or flexing my arms so they could feel it or, or you know, kind of like, making them feel like they're bigger and stronger than I am and kind of making myself a little sh smaller. I shrink in the face of somebody bumping into me or, or stepping on my foot or, or trying to challenge me. They always want to arm wrestle. But the last thing I wanted to do when I was out was be tough just because it, it escalates so quick. And, and especially today, like I'm, I'm older now. So now, you know, you don't know where the next guy's going to pull a gun out, right? They just pull them out because that's all they got. And yep. uh, there's, there's no fighting anymore. You know, they got a knife or a gun and, and it happens in the blink of an eye, you know, wife, kids. Last thing I want to do is wind up getting into some street fight with somebody that's crazier than, and, and has nothing to lose. Yep. So, Sean, yep. physical fighting aside and the threat of that, who or what, if anything or anybody, intimidates you? Well, I mean, there's not a, I'm not, I don't surround myself in situations where I get intimidated. I mean, not, I came not, up. But not, not physical violence, anything in life at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't. It's weird in my industry, right? It's a different industry than what you guys are familiar with in bodybuilding. It's all show. Uh, you know, I'm recognized for what I used to look like, and now I'm respected because of what I learned from how I got there. Uh, I parlayed how I learned bot to build my body into being a pitch man for products and, and hosting like boss, hosting shows, you know, being the color commentator and a promoter. But I, I really haven't been in a, a situation – uh, where I'm intimidated. I don't, I don't run the streets. I don't put myself in a position where I'm running into some bad people. I travel the world, but look, where I go, I'm going into places where I'm kind of celebrated. When I go into a gym, you know, I imagine for these guys, like going into a boxing ring or an MMA arena, you come in there, you know, based on what your sweat equity was as a celebrity. Uh, we have great admiration for each other, whether it's bodybuilding, MMA, or boxing uh, as athletes. But when you take me out of my element and take me into a house party or take me someplace that I'm not familiar with or it's not in my comfort zone, I'm, my senses are alerted, but I don't, I'm not afraid. I don't get intimidated. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But I typically don't go into dark areas and places I'm not wanted, you know. Yep. How about Bean? Anybody, anything intimidate you? Well, you know, I'm married and I got to sleep sometimes, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like boss. I mean – I get I, I I try to not get into a fight. There's no money involved, and it hurts the next day. Um, I'm pretty easy going, but every once in a while I get worried because there's a point at me that I snap, and when it when it gets past that snapping stage, I don't fully. Really, it's just all an instinct. I I mean I I lose it, so I, I I try not to go out a lot of public places because of that because people do try to challenge and whatnot. I'm really easy going though. I try to be easy going always. So I've smoothed things over a lot just be by being easy going. Because yep. they don't want to bring the dark side of me out. 
Paul says even the scariest guys he knows are always scared of their wives. <laughs> so, that's we got awesome. a time, Rick. Think about it. <laughs> I got you, man. I got you, my friend. Well, hey, we are um we are about we're about there, guys. Um, what are the big goals for the week? What's uh what's everybody up to? Sean, what do you got going, man? Yeah, well, I'm I'm out of here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. I fly to Columbus, Ohio. I believe this is the thirty fourth year of the thirty uh, third year of the Arnold Classic, and I've never missed one since nineteen eighty nine. So I'm glad uh, to be out there, spend time with Arnold, the, the supplement company I work with, Mutant. Is one of the official sponsors we're going to present on stage. And my partner, uh, Dr. Morales out of Houston, Texas, is presenting a $10,000 Best Poser Award for the first time to Classic Physique Division. So anytime you can go to the Arnold Classic, be around some of the guys you kind of came up with in the game. Ronnie Coleman's getting a Lifetime Achievement Award directly from Arnold. Some other people that have gotten that have been uh, Triple H got it uh, a year or so ago, Linda Murray, um, Sylvester Stallone, a lot of people that have made some big moves in bodybuilding and in entertainment, uh, Arnold is recognized, including his old training partner, Franco Colombo. So it's a good, it's the second largest show behind the Mr. Olympia in prestige. Um, so I'll be out there uh, tomorrow until Sunday, and it's a one day event this year because the COVID restrictions. So we're not going to have the huge expo. Typically, this is a four day weekend, 220,000 fans, 22,000 athletes. This year, it's only four different professional divisions, no strongman, no cheerleading, no no expo. So it's really gotten dumbed down because of COVID restrictions. But it'll be back up full torque March 2022. Nice. Bean, good, best, best of luck with that, Sean. That sounds Thank like you. a good weekend coming up, man. Bean, That's anything crazy. good happening? Any big goals for the week? What are you working on, man? Man, I'm still working on my weight. I'm, I'm watching what I'm eating. I'm really, I'm it's still dropping four or five pounds a week. I'm headed up to Tennessee this weekend to, to hang out up there with some good friends, and uh, I'm gonna have a blast this week. My my day, my weekend's gonna be simple. I'm gonna relax really a lot. <laughs> right on. Hey, boss, I would ask you next, but I want to save you for last because you're always fun and happy go lucky, and my my mine's a little heavy and deep. I think, um, you know. Eric, you remember my you remember my friend Brett Barony. My, my best friend I've ever had died suddenly just recently. It was unexpected. And there was a lot of thing reparations that needed to be made between he and I that I didn't get to do. And I'm talking with my therapist today, who, who I love dearly, because it's all good for all of us, I think. And he, we talked about just being present and uh and being kind with our friends and uh you know realizing at the risk of sounding dramatic, that this moment may be the last. So as I sit here, you see my dogs wandering everywhere with my dogs in my beautiful home in Hawaii, feeling so blessed. My goal this week is just to be really focused on relationships and be the best I can be with everybody. So that's the heavy stuff. And that's where I am this week. No, I love it. I love it. And uh, <clears throat> Sean, I was I was uh, inducted, you know, like at uh, at the Arnold Classic, and the the one thing to so if you ever get to speak to him is when because afterwards he came, walked over to me, Arnold, and I was sitting at the table, and my knees were so shot I couldn't stand up. So he says, "Oh, I said, oh, my very nice meeting you." And then later on, I thought I should have gotten up even with yeah. the pain in my knees. You know, I mean that was not cool. So, but yeah. it was killing me so bad. So, but anyway, that's my story. I'll let him. This I'll, week, tell, I'll let him know that. I'll tell him that. Yeah, please do because I always thought, you know, man, that was an idiot move. So uh, we've all had we've all had those moments before. We all have those moments. I call, yeah. Hey, listen, I called Randy Couture, Chuck Liddell. You know, I know oh. both. But when I saw Randy, I go, "Hey, Chuck, what's going on?" He looked at me like he wanted to just, kill. I wanted to die. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, well guys, I'm, I'm going to do some. I'm going to do something cool tomorrow. What's I'm going to induct Kevin Reynolds oh, into the UFC Hall of Fame. Nice. So, yeah, so for you guys that know, we fought each other for the UFC title, uh, and uh, we became friends afterwards. And now they, uh, his wife asked me if I wanted to uh, induct him into the UFC Hall of Fame, and I, I, I love it. You know, I think it's, a, it's an honor. It's cool. Uh, so we're going to talk about how we met and what happened. You know, the first time I met him in an elevator, we were both together in an elevator. It was really funny, you know, and he started telling me, hey, uh, good luck tomorrow. I said, oh, good luck to you, man. It's awesome, and we saw each other smiling in the reflection of the doors. <laughs> and then the next day, we were fighting each other for the heavyweight championship. So, yeah, those moments and uh, how my nickname came to pass, and he had a big part in that. 
So uh, yeah. it's going to be cool to tell that story to the people and to let everybody know what an amazing person he was. Hey, That's real right. quick, I want to give uh, Butterbean a shout out, inducting into the Hall of Fame in Alabama, the Boxing Hall of Fame. Hey, thank you. Congratulations, my man. That's a big deal. <laughs> That is, that is awesome. Well, That's guys, you, it's man. so good seeing you guys again. Have, have an amazing, great week, everybody. We are back next Wednesday at the same time with a special guest to be announced. Following week, we have Kurt Engel, um, Sean Ray, Butterbean, Boss Rutten. Man, it's my pleasure and my privilege to uh, get to do this with you guys every week. Thank you so much. All right. um, and again, you before we sign you? off, but to the unsung heroes, Behind the behind the curtain, Rachel Sartoris, our wonderful producer, who has been working her ass off and making this come together for us. Thank you, Rachel. Huge thanks to John Paz, who's always there for us. And uh, signing off for Talking Tough. We'll see you next week. Godspeed. Talking Tough, the world's toughest men and women at their most vulnerable.